we are having this discussion because on the 2nd of May, a draft Supreme Court decision was leaked, which seeks to overturn the 1973 Roe versus Wade decision that legalized abortion across the USA. So this is happening in the context of a wider attack on sexual and reproductive freedoms. Several states, notably Texas, have attempted or succeeded to push through anti-abortion legislation, while anti-abortion activists have been mobilized on the ground targeting uh, clinics. Well, um, meanwhile, sexual education in the US, already in a bad state, is also under attack, with LGBT youth in particular being targeted. Um, so Florida's um, Don't Say Gay bill, which um, prohibits people from discussing um, gender identity and sexual orientation in classrooms is the example I'm thinking of here. So in this talk, um, I'm going to talk a little bit about the history of Roe versus Wade, uh, the repercussions of it being overturned and the fight back. Um, so I want to make it clear in this talk that the attack on Roe versus Wade is an attack on workers and on sexual liberation. So by sexual liberation, I'm talking about a broad range of um, political rights. So the right to reproductive autonomy, um, the freedom to decide how we relate to ourselves and each other sexually, the right to form families and relationships on our own terms, the right to express ourselves and freedom from discrimination based on gender, sexuality, family status, or reproductive physiology. As socialists, we envisage a society where everyone has these freedoms, and I'd like to couch our approach to reproductive rights in these terms. So I'd like to start with some basic socialist analysis of how reproduction and reproductive freedom uh, fits into capitalism in general. So uh, we believe that reproductive oppression is tied to the family. So under capitalism, our productive labor is exploited by our employers for profit. But in order for this to happen, reproductive labor also needs to happen. This means the having and raising of children, caring for the sick and elderly, meeting the basic needs of workers at the end of the working day, so that they are ready to be exploited again the next day. In capitalist society, the responsibility for this is largely pushed onto individual isolated nuclear families and particularly onto women. This is justified ideologically by appealing to gender roles. Women are born to procreate and to nurture, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Um, so broadly speaking, um, abortion fits into this in several ways. So, Limiting the ability to control pregnancy reinforces gender roles by making women more dependent on men. It limits their ability to seek employment outside the home and to fight for fair conditions and pay in this employment. And it ties women in particular to the nuclear family because if they can't control pregnancy, then they're going to need the support of the nuclear family to raise the child. Um, uh, one knows that support is not coming from anywhere else in society in the USA. So the slogan that I am taking as my starting point for this talk is uh, this one. So sex is not a crime and pregnancy should not be punishment. Um, okay. So criminalizing abortion, like criminalizing homosexuality, is in a sense a way of criminalizing sex outside the accepted structure of the family. When control of pregnancy is limited, sexual desire becomes a force that traps people within the socially accepted form of the family. In this way, pregnancy and child raising is used to discipline workers. And when I say that pregnancy is a punishment under this regime, I'm also thinking about the horrific conditions that pregnant workers have to endure in countries like the USA. But there's also an ideological and a psychological aspect to criminalizing abortion. The criminalization of abortion is part of a wider attack on sexual freedoms, and in particular on women's sexuality. It's a way of reinforcing the idea that women's bodies are not our own, that they exist for reproduction, and that our sexual desires are wrong and should be punished. There are deep contradictions in the ruling class's attack on abortion rights in the US right now. So 
driven by conservative ideology. The ruling classes in the US can be seen making attacks on reproductive rights that make little sense from any practical perspective. And that from a social and economic point of view inflict damage that they themselves will feel in lost profits and productivity. In cases like these, it often seems that the need to punish and terrorize oppressed people actually trumps more immediate practical concerns. So a little bit on the background of Roe versus Wade. So Roe versus Wade was a landmark decision by the Supreme Court that recognized the constitutional right to access abortion. It made abortion legal across the United States, overturning laws that banned abortion um, in 29 states prior to Roe. The Roe name is Jane Roe, the pseudonym of Norma McCorvey, a 22-year-old in Dallas, who in 1970 wished to terminate a pregnancy and was denied by the Texas law at the time. I was a woman alone with no place to go and no job, she told the press in 1973. No one wanted to hire a pregnant woman. I felt there was no one in the world who could help me. Two Dallas attorneys, Sarah Weddington and Linda Coffey, took on the Corby's case. They had been seeking a case to help them challenge, challenge the Texas abortion law. The Wade in Roe versus Wade was Henry Wade, the Dallas County attorney, District Attorney who enforced the Texas law. The case went before the Supreme Court and Roe's lawyers utilized decades of case law to successfully argue that the right to access abortion was implied by the Constitution. Roe versus Wade was won in 1973, changing the landscape of abortion law across the states. The Chief Justice at the time was Warren Burger, an appointee of Republican President Richard Nixon. Six of the justices at the time of the decision were, at the time the decision were made, were Republican appointees. Significant pressure outside the courtroom helped to ensure this victory, but we'll talk more about that later on. So the impacts of legalizing abortion cannot be understated. In 1965, in the USA, abortion was so unsafe that 17% of all deaths due to pregnancy and childbirth were the result of illegal abortion. Today, less than 0.3% of all women undergoing legal abortions at all gestational ages sustain a serious complication requiring hospitalization. This is in the US. So Roe versus Wade needs to be protected, but it's important to note that it is limited, grounded not in an absolute right to access abortion, but in the right to privacy. Sarah Weddington herself, one of Roe's lawyers, quickly identified limitations in the victory, which left the door wide open for restrictions to come. Reflecting on this later, she quoted law student Bobby Nelson, who helped to research the case. He said, we must understand that the battle has only just begun and abortion still costs $140, more than many pregnant women can afford. Few doctors have the modern equipment. Most will still require the consent of a husband. This was at the time that the law was passed. As Weddington foresaw, subsequent laws and alterations have weakened the protection of abortions given by Wade. Roe versus Wade. In the original decision, the court ruled that, um, that a woman has the absolute right during the first three months of pregnancy to decide whether to bear her child. Justice Harry Blackman, in the majority opinion, wrote that the right of privacy is broad enough to encompass a woman's decision of whether to terminate the pregnancy. In 1992, uh, in a 1992 decision, the court replaced the trimester framework with an undue burden test. States couldn't erect substantial obstacles to obtaining an abortion before viability, raising the question of what an undue burden is. In states that wish to limit access, the interpretation is not generous. This is just one of the many watering downs beginning in the mid 1970s. State and federal bans on funding for abortions were upheld as were requirements that young people obtain consent or notify their parents prior to an abortion. Within the framework of Roe, states have managed to erect significant barriers to access. It would take far too long to give details state by state, so I'm going to zoom in on Mississippi as an example. So Mississippi, where abortion is nominally legal um, before 20 weeks, has some of the most restrictive abortion laws in the country. So providers of abortion services must be licensed as an abortion facility and must comply with 35 pages of administrative 
professional qualification, patient and employee testing, and physical plant requirements. Mississippi requires abortion services after the first trimester be provided in, in an ambulatory surgical facility. That facility cannot be located within 1,500 feet of a church, school, or kindergarten. The law gives authority to bring a cause of action against doctors who provide abortions. This can be brought on behalf of the father of the person getting the abortion, the father of the pregnancy if he is married to the woman, um, and the woman or the person who is getting the abortion's parents or guardian if they are a minor. Um, there are strict parental consent laws for minors, including getting the consent of both parents. A woman may not obtain a person, so I'm taking it straight from the law, but a person may not obtain an abortion until at least 24 hours after the doctor has inferred, uh, has informed them of the probable gestational age of the unborn child, uh, described health risks associated with the procedure, many of which are spurious. In addition, at least 24 hours prior to abortion, the person must have received a state mandated lecture by the physician or a physician's agent in person about prenatal care and child support payments. She can also uh, be shown state prepared materials that describe with color pictures the, the anatomical and physiological characteristics of the fetus at two week gestational increments. <sighs> so, um, <laughs> so Mississippi laws. Um, outlaws the use of dilation and evacuation procedure, unless it is necessary to save a person's life. Um, causing people to have to undergo more invasive and potentially more dangerous procedures. The law prohibits abortion coverage and in health insurance, prohibits abortion coverage for public employees, prohibits public funding for people eligible for state medical assistance, um, and of course, healthcare providers are allowed to refuse service for reasons of conscience. Um, providing an abortion outside of these parameters carries a penalty of up to 10 years in prison. For context, Mississippi is one of the poorest states and people in low wage jobs often don't receive health insurance. Um, uh, people can enroll in Medicaid during pregnancy, but the coverage disappears as soon as they give birth. Mississippi has the highest rate of infant mortality in the US. Uh, black infants were about twice as likely as white infants to die during the first year of life in Mississippi. Um, the people trying to access abortions are disproportionately poor and from racialized minorities. In Mississippi, people of color comprise 44% of the population, but 80% of the people seeking abortions. Sex education in schools emphasizes abstinence, forbids discussion of abortion, along with demonstrations of how to use contraceptives. When seeking abortion, people are often misled by advertising to approach crisis pregnancy centers, which are in fact anti-abortion. With all of these barriers in place, people are often unable to access an abortion until it is too late to receive one, which is of course a difficult point. Um, so this is the context of the leak that happened earlier this month, indicating that the Supreme Court had voted to strike down Roe versus Wade. The draft opinion that was leaked um, has been described as a full-throated, unflinching repudiation of the 1973 decision. So um, this decision is not yet final. Um, the court's holding will be final when it is published, likely in the next two months. According to the Politico article where this information was first published, um, four of the other Republican appointed justices, Clarence Thomas, Neil Gorich, Brett Kavanaugh, and Amy Coney Barrett, have voted with Alito. The three Democratic appointed judges, uh, Stephen Breyer, Sonia Sotomayor, and Elena Kag Kagan, are working on one or more dissents how Chief Justice John Roberts will ultimately vote and whether he will join an already written opinion or draft his own is unclear. So the overturning of Roe versus Wade would have huge legal consequences that in turn would lead to devastating physical, social, financial, and psychological repercussions for people across the US. 
Legal protection for abortion would be removed in many states. Um, 13 states have trigger laws banning abortions ready to come into effect. In some states, pre row laws banning abortions will come back into effect. Um, several states are already imposing new restrictions on abortion, including Mississippi, Florida, Idaho, Kentucky, and Oklahoma. Um, so even when abortions are criminalized, there are ways to obtain them. So when the recent ban was introduced in Texas, some were able to obtain abortions by traveling or by ordering pills online. While abortions in Texas fell by half following the recent ban, um, when, other, when abortions obtained by other means are taken into account, the overall decline was only around 10%. But without Roe, um, abortion would probably decline more because people would have to travel further to reach a state where it was legal. Um, because of the expected increase in inter interstate travel, um, remaining clinics would be likely to have less capacity to treat people who are able to reach them. Um, research from December on the estimated changes in distances to clinics found that if Roe were overturned, the number of legal abortions would be likely to fall by around 14%. So without access to abortion, people will die. Um, the United States has one of the highest rates of mortality for birthing parents in the world. And studies have found that the rate of medical complications is higher for people who have been denied abortions that they saw. In total, around 700 people die of pregnancy-related complications every year. The US maternal mortality rate in 2020 was 23.8, the highest it has been since the four row. For black people, it was 55.3. That's deaths per 10,000 population. Because of the development of um, abortion pills that the FDA approved in 2000, um, the risks of people dying from unsafe um, sort of back alley abortions is less likely than pre roll but not impossible. Um, in 2010, a study of 1,000 women called the Turnaway Study found that being denied an abortion had significant medical, financial, and psychological impacts. Um, so the women who were denied an abortion were far more likely to face medical complications and two of them in the study died. They faced financial repercussions, their mental health suffered. Um, these impacts were intergenerational. So in the turnaround study, um, uh, they found that um, those denied abortions are more likely to stay in contact with violent partners and to have trouble affording basic living expenses than the women who'd had abortions. Their children were more likely to live below the federal poverty line. Um, yeah. um, in addition to this, there is some concern that the overturning of Roe versus Wade will have legal implications beyond abortion rights. So Alito's draft argues that rights protected by the Constitution, but not explicitly mentioned in it, so-called um, unenumerated rights, must be strongly rooted in US tradition and history. So this calls into question other rights that have been upheld by the court in recent history, such as the right to contraception, the right to procreate, the right to engage in private se consensual sexual activity, and to marry someone of the same sex or of a different race. It's extremely likely that some states at the very least will begin prohibiting certain types of contraception, such as the IUD and the morning after pill. So all of this will become a site of struggle um, as abortion and related issues become dominant in elections for Congress, for state legislature, for city councils and for judgeships. So finally, on the fight back to this. So pro-abortion forces uh, responded quickly to the leap on the second. That night, activists mobilized outside the Supreme Court where police had already put up barricades in anticipation of backlash. The following day, thousands of people built emergency protests around the country. A national day of action was called by Planned Parenthood um, and the Women's March, among others, on the 14th. So tens of thousands mobilized across the country. 
pro-abortion protesters confronted anti-abortion counter-protesters at the Supreme Court and on the Brooklyn Bridge to Manhattan. Um, from the masses gathered, there is energy to keep fighting. One activist in Vanity Fair was quoted in saying that for the women of this country, this will be a summer of rage. So protest is how Roe versus Wade was won in the first place, off the back of the women's liberation movement of the 1960s and 70s. This movement employed tactics learned from the anti-war and the civil rights movements, mass demonstrations, direct actions, speak outs and occupations. They raised the slogan, free abortion on demand without apology. To go back to Bobby Nelson, one of the researchers for the Roe versus Wade case, um, they're quoted in saying, we must understand that the Supreme Court was responding not just to the technical and impressive briefs or strong oral arguments on the rights of women. They were responding to the rallying of women across the nation, a rejection of women as reproductive machines and an acceptance for women as individuals capable of choice. The most far-sighted of the activists organizing now are pushing beyond defending Roe to demand the extension of reproductive rights. The most far-sighted are also looking to the streets for the forces that can defend abortion rights, not just to the ballot box. It's important to remember that the majority of people in America support legal abortion. One in every three women has had an abortion before the age of reaching 45. Commentary from many grassroots organizers expressed fears that the energy and rage mobilized in response to this attack would be diverted into passive support for the Democrats. I listened to a talk by a veteran pro-abortion campaigner named Dana Cloud, and she spelled out this danger extremely well with an anecdote from 2013. So at this time, an anti-abortion bill was on the floor in Texas. There was a mass demonstration in the Capitol. Um, so this bill had to be passed by midnight of that night. Approaching midnight, thousands of protesters flooded the chamber, chanting and yelling so loudly that they could not hear to pass the bill in its way. Um, so they were proud to be described in the news as shouting a bill to death. Um, what Cloud recalls happening next, however, is that um, Democratic candidate Wendy Davis, among others, urged people to leave the Capitol and to redirect their energy to a rally to elect a Democratic politician, at which point the governor of Texas called a special session and passed the legislation. So Cloud makes the point that um, politicians in the courts are only as responsive as we make them. Um, Biden's track record on abortion is not great. Um, the slogan of the Clinton administration was that abortion should be safe, legal, and fair. These kinds of retreats from the principle of safe, free abortion on demand and without apology is what we should expect from the Dems and from the courts. Um, and the final point that I want to end on is that abortion rights are workers' rights and that it's extremely, this is extremely important for the fight back. So in the immediate aftermath of the leak, many unions, um, including the nurses union and the flight attendants union, um, have issued statements defending abortion rights. So um, the AFL CIO president, Liz Tuller, wrote that access to health care without fear and intimidation is every person's right. We must be able to control our own bodies, which has a direct impact on economic justice and the ability of working people to make a better life for themselves and their families. So writing for um, the website in these times, labor activist and author Kim Kelly made a call for a stronger stand on abortion rights from unions. Um, so I'm gonna quote her because I think she puts this really well. <clears throat> so it matters that so many workers are not only at risk of unwanted pregnancy themselves, but are also expected to engage in reproductive labor, the so-called women's work that is so often undervalued and underpaid or wholly unpaid. It matters that pregnant workers face discrimination as well as physical and medical hazards on the job. And far too many don't have access to quality health care or paid parental leave. It matters that workers who do not want to have a baby or cannot do so safely are about to have that choice stolen from them. 
and that forced birth is the only option on offer from the most powerful court in the land, as illegitimate as it is and always has been. And I'll leave with, with some final words from Kim Kelly. Anything less than a full-throated defense of workers' rights, including their right to make their own decisions about their health, body, and sexual life is unacceptable. It is anti-worker and anti-life.